let's begin. Do we have, I don't have the sound, but it's probably not necessary, but for the live stream. Do you hear that? Oh, that is, you do hear it? Okay, I just must not hear it because I'm losing my hearing. Uh, let, let's begin, let's begin tonight in prayer and ask that God would, would come near and help us. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you that it brings life. It is the word of life, and I pray that we would hold fast to the word of life tonight. I pray that it, the word of life would so penetrate our hearts that it would keep us from grumbling and, and doubting and disputing and quarreling. And I pray that as a result, it would be the kind of not grumbling and a contentment that would cause our, us to shine as lights in the world. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to begin. Welcome a few of you who are new to our Wednesday nights. Glad to have you with us. We're going to start like we normally do um, with the fighter verse. But before we do that, I have some, some giveaways tonight. Um, I like to give out some resources, and I pray that the right person will grab it if they need one, and God will use it in your life either now or later. Um, my biggest giveaway is a book that I mentioned in a sermon about two or three weeks ago, Dark Clouds, Deep Mercies, Discovering the Grace of Lament. This is a really helpful, rich, and deep book um, for someone that's going through a time of really suffering or crying out to God, and I really recommend it. Is there someone that would say, hey, I think I'd read it, and if so, I'd give it to you. Someone want it right now? Right? Okay, Donna, love to. I hope this will be a blessing to you, Donna. And then I have four little booklets um, that are, they're just great to stick in your Bible, stick it on your uh, bed stand. It's helpful to just kind of dig through these. these. Sometimes books don't change your life, but a paragraph might, something that really would impact your life. This is Providence, the idea of Providence by Charles Spurgeon. Um, and then, anyone want this? Great, Charles. How to be free from bitterness. Okay, who needs this? <laughs> Scott. Okay, Scott, you don't have this already? <laughs> I mean, I've been giving, I've been giving, <laughs> Scott. <laughs> um, intercessory prayer by Spurgeon. Intercessory prayer. This is on, it's probably a sermon on praying in an intercessory way. Everything that you read of Spurgeon's are rich and good. Who would like intercessory prayer? Anyone? If not, then we'll hold that. Oh, let's see. It's Morgan, right? Yes. Okay. Wow, that's good. I, I will. I will look. She can have it. No. Go. I, I'll. I'll. I'll order another one. If Sharon, I'll make sure we get you one. And then this one. This is from. We we've mentioned this. This is the Chapel Library Free Grace Broadcaster. It has about seven short little sermons or articles on the subject of obedience. We've been talking about obedience and the, God's word in obedience, the gospel in obedience, God's grace in obedience, God's law in obedience, the, our faith in obedience, our love in obedience, Christ's friends obey him, Christ's obedience saves us. Who would like this one? Okay. All right. I do pray that God will Use those as helps and instructions in your life. Let's look at this fighter verse. It's long. It's fighter verses. It's a great psalm to memorize. Uh, here it is. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation, my glory, my mighty rock. My refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Okay, what stands out to you about this passage? Or what do you love? Or um, observations? Or questions for the text? Yes, Charles. I like the word only. Yeah. Where do we find that? What? 
okay, which is very similar to this. There's like this, for God alone, and he only. I, I need two. What else? Yeah, Donna. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Right. In fact, though we're not, yeah, that's good. That's a hard word too, isn't it? To wait. Yeah. Larry. Really? So that's what stands out. I shall not be shaken. Okay. Can you sing it for us right now? Okay, another time. (laughs) Nobody's going to bring up a song now. (laughs) Yes. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, good. So you have this rock. And he is my fortress. You built your fortresses with rocks. And he's a place where, like we've been seeing in the Psalms already, he's our refuge. We run to him for refuge. I, I, love, I love how this kind of ends. Trusting in him at all times, O people. It's like an appeal. You just say, oh, God. trust in him at all times. Yeah, Ben. Hmm. Pour out your heart before him. Right here. There we got, there's the theme of refuge. We've got refuge and fortress. Does anybody have your Bible to read? Does there, is there a title to this? I think there is. Okay, and is there, does it give us any instruction of who wrote it or no? It is a Psalm of David? Okay, so David wrote it. From, last thing, this, this is the type of Psalm to memorize. This is, a, not just this week, with it, it's a long, this is a one week long fighter verse. In fact, If you're going to take this, even just memorize the first verse or the first two verses or the last verse. But uh, this this is a a psalm to just really digest. And what kind of psalm do you think this is? What kind? How would you categorize the psalm? You don't have to have an official category that, what what would you put it as? Okay, a psalm of safety. Okay. What is David doing in this psalm? So he's praising. What else? He's praising him as he's declaring who he is. I read it as he's kind of reminding himself that this is where he needs to be. Mm-hmm. Where do you get that he's reminding himself? I mean, he is talking, well, see, oh, my soul. So when you read through these psalms, sometimes as you meditate on them, think through them, it's really helpful to ponder, who is he talking to? Sometimes he's talking to himself, oh, my soul. And now over here, he's talking to the, then he switches. In some psalms, they switch from that to talking to God. Oh, Lord, turn and save me. Rescue me. So that it, it and and so often our prayers they do ramble, they move from one thing to another. You know they might be, God help me and oh, stop, stop being distracted, Daniel. <laughs> you know or Psalm forty two. Why are you in despair, O oh my soul? Why are you downcast? Hope in God, for you will again praise Him. Our, these psalms will talk to themselves. They'll preach to themselves. 
they'll instruct themselves. Several years back, I, I memorized Psalm 62. I can't say it to you right now. It's very familiar to me, but it's very fond to me in that I spent many hours taking walks, pondering Psalm 62. I really, really recommend you digging into this psalm. That said, let's look at, take out your sheets. If you don't have, does everyone have a sheet? If you don't have a sheet when you came in, Mark will help you if you raise your hand. Or, or Lee. Thanks, guys. Great. Keep your hand raised if you need a sheet. Okay. Yes. Yes, a song, I asked the question, what category? It's a song of confidence, which is, you know, his confidence in his security, his safety, yes, good. Carrie. Um, I just have to say, uh, there's a song that Joe McGill told me that is everyone should take, and it is, you know, based on that verse, and I think that's the song a few times that will make you comfortable, and I'll hear that in the car, or, you know, and just a good reminder that wow. Wow. Hmm. Great. It is. I mean, you don't necessarily have your Bible, and you're just driving, and that song comes on, and it's just, you know, God yes. gave me that reminder that I am what you are with. Amen. Thanks for sharing that, Carrie. Um, okay, we're going to look at Philippians. We're going to look at Philippians chapter 2. We are tonight on our... We are on our week... We're on week 22 of Philippians... Philippians 2, 14 through 18, we'll probably take at least another week on this paragraph of 14 through 18. Paul has just finished saying that work out your salvation, obey, he says, just as you obeyed in my presence, obey even more in my absence, verse 12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. That's verse 13. Now he moves to this. We started this last week. Let me read this, and I want you to stare at the text either on your sheet or up on the board for just a minute, and I, I want to get your observations. Last week, we started with making the connection of this, do all things without grumbling. We're going to continue on. So this is what Paul says to the church. Do all things without grumbling or disputing which we said could be quarreling or even doubting God, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be pr proud that I did not run in vain. This is Paul speaking, I Paul, I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Okay. There is a lot in these verses, and I put them together because they are one unit, it's a, in a sense a paragraph here, but I'd love to get your thoughts on early observations. Could be even, we need to figure out what that means to understand the text. Or it might be a connection. Yes, Morgan. Uh, I guess my question would be, is there such thing as like a spiritual practice where you're like like taking time to pray out your thoughts? Okay. Even if I am poured out as a drink offering, what is he talking about? What's the context? Great. And if we've been we've been studying this letter and we've been reading, we find in chapter one he's actually in prison. And the possibility he thinks he's going to get out of prison 
But there's a possibility he may suffer even to the point of death. And of course he does. I think that we're, we're going to probably more dig on this, dig into this next week. But yes, that's, you know, what does he mean here? As a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, what, what does he mean? Why does he use this kind of language to talk even about this? And in this case, he's going to say, uh, even if I'm going to do that, I am glad and rejoice with you. Good, good question. Good comment. Question. He's going to. He actually says at the end of chapter one, he says, "You're going to suffer the same kinds of suffering that I endure." Okay. What else, Charles? Well, I like the crooked and twisted generation. Mm-hmm. But you, you, that stands out to you. Charles likes this part. <laughs> Yeah. Paul's writing to disciples, and Paul is so passionate about the gospel that he brought to this church in Philippi, and he's concerned that they spread that gospel, and the gospel is defended and, and prospered in the midst of a crooked generation that they're bringing. They're, they're bringing that into. Yes. What else? Great. We're going to, if we get there, that's, this is holding fast. What does that mean? I, I'm going to, I'll just say right now, I believe that the purpose of, there's two possibilities of this holding fast to the, the word of God. And some, some have said that this means we are to hold forth the word of truth. Like, okay, because remember, they're, they're bringing the gospel. And so you're to do this. As you hold, you shine as a light, holding forth the, the word of life. Though that's true, we are to hold forth the truth of God. It's more consistently used by Paul to mean holding fast to the word personally, both to defend it in the midst of a crooked generation and for it to be your sustaining power. And so I'm going to put this word Put it in green here. Buy. So I think we'll even get now into a little bit of the lesson. Or that he says, "Among whom you shine in lights of the world, by holding fast to the word of life." But then Donna brings up the question: How do you hold fast? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you shine, that's the witness. See that that's kind of a witness word. You're shining as lights. You are to shine as lights in this twisted world, in this twisted generation, crooked and twisted generation, and you do by holding fast to the word of life. This word, this idea of word of life, is actually has this word, means logos, which is the word, the word, and this, uh, the word that brings life, and almost everyone would say and agree that this really means the gospel, now, more than the gospel and that all the implications of the gospel, all that's embedded about the gospel that saves and rescues and transforms us, you are to hold fast to this gospel as you shine forth as lights. Dan. Mm. <laughs> he did.
Yeah. Let, let's quickly look there. Um, would you turn to Matthew 5, 11? Thanks for, you are lights. You, you shine as lights. And so you're going to need to hold fast to the word of truth. And you need to not grumble. I, I'm not sure if Paul had this in mind. He might have had this in mind. I think this is a great parallel text where he says, we looked at this at the end last week. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Look at verse 11. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Now remember, Paul's in prison here. He's probably been reviled against and he's been persecuted and he's been reviled against. And he's warned already in Philippians 1 that he says that you're going to have opponents and you're going to suffer. So you're going to face these kinds of oppositions on your mission as disciples, as lights in a crooked generation. So his command here is to not gr- do all things, all things, without, without grumbling or disputing, quarreling. And notice how he says, now, rejoice and be glad. This is back to Matthew 11, or 5.11, or now into verse 12. Rejoice and be glad. So instead of the response to reviling and persecution is rejoicing and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So... The opposite, what would we say is the opposite of grumbling? Giving thanks, thanks, rejoicing. So, the op, I don't know, what's what's the sign for the opposite? Is there a sign? What? Explanation and an equal sign? We'll just say it is. <laughs> uh, the, o- the opposite of this is, is gratitude, rejoicing. Can we say joy? Can we say contentment? Contented people don't grumble, right? Jesus says... When they revile you and persecute you, rejoice, be grateful. And right, just two verses later, we'll skip the part where he says, you are the salt of the earth. And that's, it's a great passage. I'm not, but I want to just jump right to verse 14. You are the light of the world. And as Dan pointed out, he didn't say try to be the light. You are the light of the world. What kind of light are you? You're the only light in the world. He sent us to be that light. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp. And and I I think there's this connection, and I, I just, I think that, so what is the purpose of this command? How does do not grumble and complain connect to our mission here to shine as lights in the world? Okay, you can't be out. You can't be without blemish. Now, in this this passage, to be blameless and innocent and without blemish doesn't mean perfectionism that you're going to be a sinless Christian, but it is it is the the growing in godliness and the goal in which we're all to attain to. So much so that in Philippians one, when at the very beginning of the letter, he says, "I pray, I pray that you." will abound, your love will abound more and more in knowledge and discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless at the day of Jesus Christ. He's praying that you will be pure and blameless. And now he gets to this part. and He's saying, now do all things, all your evangelism, your living life as a church, interacting with each other, living life, do all things without grumbling. Instead, be content in all things. So that you will be blameless in your shining as a light. 
How does not grumbling shine as a light? Yeah. Yeah. I had someone tell me just recently that when their husband was going through cancer in a pretty significant way, the type of joy and the contentment and non-grumbling attitude he had made people just go, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I mean, are you just, is your head in the sand? In the end... There, there was a reality that this man's simple faith was, God loves me. He's taking care of me, and I'm trusting him. What kind of person can not grumble but rejoice and be content through these trials, and they shine through as lights in the world? And yet, is it often a case, are, do Christians grumble too? And, and when we grumble, is that sin? What kind, of, what kind of sin does it reveal? Usually, it's at the heart of grumbling is what? Unbelief. Do you hear that? Do you, do you guys, how is that unbelief, Mike? Well, it tells you right here, you should be holding fast to the word of life. You're grumbling and complaining. You're, you're basically saying, I don't believe. I'm not believing in the goodness of God right now. At least at that moment, my grumbling is defying, it's, it's revealing an unbelief at that moment. And believers struggle with unbelief. <laughs> at that moment, it just, at that moment, we, and that's we, whether it be our anxiety, our frustration, our impatience, and our grumbling, our discontentment reveals an unbelief in God. So, those that truly, I, I do think that part of this letter, you could say it, there's a lot of ways you could say what this whole letter is about. Part of this letter is about saying, I want to make you grumbleless Christians who are full of joy because the gospel has so got down to the depths of your heart that it's changing the way you have. I mean, look at the way he finishes this paragraph. I am glad and rejoice with you, even if I die, even if I suffer. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. He, this is the happiest letter in the Bible. It, it is constantly talking about this joy and gratitude. And he, he says, that is one of the ways we shine as lights in the world. And this, this, this joy, this gladness, this contentment, this non-grumbling comes not just by some stoical determination, I'm not going to grumble, but I'm not happy about it. <laughs> you know, that's not how it is. It is, he loves me. He gave himself for me. He's working all things together for good. My, my future is secure. And even when we have setbacks, he works all things for my good. Yeah, Molly. Well, it just to me, um, children of God stand out when we're talking about this. Yeah. Let's say um, mm. an outworking of the gospel to be a child. Amen. The gospel, there's the gospel, there's a, there's a subtle hint towards the gospel right there. You are children of God now. Be, and, and he's rescued you, he's adopted you, and, and he is your father, and he loves you. Rest in that love, that's who you are now. Show, da, show, rebla, re, show, re, resemblance of your big brother Jesus who if we were to go up this passage up you know if the scriptures kept going up and we we're in early part of Philippians 2 remember he was obedient even to the point of death and he humbled himself and became a servant he looked not to his own interests but to the interests of others and he never did it grumbling or complaining when he was reviled against he did not fight back but he kept committing himself to a faithful God 
Okay, so if, if, if one thing we could say that this exhortation, this paragraph is saying, Christians, don't grumble, never grumble. And, and don't dispute, and I, don't, don't be that kind of person. But, and he says, this next paragraph, or the next phrases or lines, would be why you shouldn't grumble. You see the why? I mean, we've been talking about it. Why or for what end? Oh, why or for what end? Someone say. For what end should we not grumble? So that you be blameless. And what's the purpose of not? Why do you want to not be blameless? So God would get the glory. And you'd shine as a light. This idea of shining a light in the world is, see, look at God. So that they'll see, in fact... We could see, I didn't read all of it, but in the Matthew 5 Sermon on, Mount, Sermon on the Mount passage, he says, so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. They'll see your good works. Oh, this, so if, if the why of not grumbling is to glorify God and in shining I think to church and unchurch, to the lost world, the crooked generation, they see something different, and it's something that I need. It's something different. And what sour, what poor testimonies we are when we're grumbling, when we, when we're grumpy old Christians. We got to fight that because we have. We have the flesh, and we face our trials, and each of us face different personalities too. I mean, some people are just more naturally bent to be cheery. That doesn't mean they're necessarily more spiritual. And some people are just a little bit more bent towards being melancholy or down. Or, and, and so the, you, got, you face that, but regardless... Paul says, do all things without grumbling. Now, I'm, I'm, you might say I'm stretching it as I go to gratitude, rejoice, and contentment, but we're going to see those themes throughout this letter. We saw it already, and we're, we're going to see it further in this letter. Now, Donna asked the question, what's the purpose of this next phrase in, in relationship to the early phrase? Colleen. Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. And so when you think about that, it just kind of fits after she says, so that I can put my heart in the right place. I believe the scripture means so that in the scripture and the scripture foundation, this is specifically about the true crown of heaven is being sure that to God. And so the only way to do that is to know the word of God and to hold fast to the word. Right, good. I, I hope you heard that. And it, if you're on live stream, what Colleen is saying is this holding fast is a ship metaphor. You're holding fast as sailors to this as you're facing the storm. In this case, it's to the word of God. And it's really difficult. It's not naturally easy. It's not a cinch to actually shine as a light by not grumbling in the midst of a crooked generation with all the difficulties and trials that we have. You know it. You've faced it in your jobs. You've faced it in schools. You've faced it in your, the experiences that you have. you face faced your own flesh. You know what I'm talking about. And, and this is, you use the phrase, Colleen, I'm not, you said this is how we do it. Or how we do it. 
we hold fast. The only way we can do it is by holding fast, he says, to the word of life. So I guess if I were preaching a sermon on this, my, my outline could be, here's the command. The command is, do all things out with grumbling, and I want to show you two things. I want to show you why you should do all things without grumbling, to glorify God, and I want to show you how you do, or how you can actually do it, because Frankly, in your own flesh, you can't do all things without grumbling. You'll grumble. The only way you're going to do it rightly and shine as lights in the world is by holding fast to the word of life. That's the only way. We, we cling. So then we would ask the question, what is, I've already said this, but what is the word of life? I believe it's the word in general, but I believe it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that has saved us. Now, how can... Let's, let's ask this question. So if we need to hold fast to the word of life, everyone agree with that? <laughs> I don't think there's anybody against that here. Um, we're all to hold fast to the word of life. How do we do that? What does it look like? Yeah, Mike? Yeah. Let's hear him. Yeah, we're, we're letting the word shine through our, through our lives. We're holding up the, now I, do, I don't think, I actually, so I think that's true, by the way. I think that the holding fast, from what I've studied in just the Greek and all of that, it's most likely not so much holding forth, even though we all agree you have to hold forth. This, Paul probably means holding fast, Either you're holding on to something tightly, not letting it go, and letting it like brace you to be able to do what you need to do. But of course, that is to bring it forth and shine light. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Amen. I mean, yes, so holding fast is the fuel so that we continue bringing it out to others. Yes. Is it Mark? Yeah. Offering? Okay. Okay. James what? Oh, in the King James. Oh, you're saying in the King James Version. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Mauricio? Yeah. Right. And he said, or a solution for what has happened and what they have suffered. Yes. The only way to, the only way to keep it is to hold it, to pay attention. And not let it go. And don't let it go. And then you keep it into uh, really. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And if you cannot hold it, you cannot give it away. So, so I think that so because the, we don't, yeah, if you're in danger, if you lose this, 
You could drift and, and start to forget what Jesus really did and how important it is and how real it is. And you could hold fast to it. It's so precious. Don't let go of it. Keep it in your mind. Keep it in your heart, what he's done for you. Yes, share it with others, but do not let it go. That which saved you. Um, I'm going to butcher this illustration. If you read the, anyone read the, the Chronicles of Narnia? In the book, The Silver Chair, they're, the children are told to read, to memorize, or at least is it two of the children are told to memorize, or just one? Is it, who was it? Polly, was she, she was supposed to memorize these, these, these words at the very beginning, and she was supposed to not forget them and just keep them in her mind over and over again. And, and in the darkness, they would come in really handy, and they did. She, and, and we... Keep the word, keep connected to the word. Now, we're going to wrap up this time and we'll, we're going to continue on and try to bring more to the end of this next time, even talking about what Paul is, Paul is addressing. I want to give you four things that I, I came across in my studies. I got from someone else that I, I want to share with you that I, I thought was really encouraging. So if we were to say the way we shine as lights, the way the way in which we can shine as lights and even overcome the power of grumbling spirit so that we're actually contented and joyful and rejoicing is by holding fast to the word of life. Uh, here, are, here are four ways. How do, I, I wrote this down. How does holding fast to the word of life provide the secret to not grumbling and instead being contented and therefore shine as a light? Here are four ways, at least, that the Word of God does this. Number one, we, the Word shows us that we have a secure outcome. A secure outcome. When, when you're facing suffering, disappointments, and frustrations that would tempt you to grumble, the, gospel, the Word of life says, well, I have a secure outcome. He who began a good work in me will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Or, as Paul said, I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to be with Christ, which is far better. He knows there's a secure outcome. When Christians know there's a secure outcome and they know it to the depths of their heart, it allows them to be content and rejoice. And that's found in the word of life. The second, the word of life brings reminds us of obedience, the reward of obedience. The reward of obedience. Or, or said in another way, the word of life promises that the pain of obedience is fully recompensed as Christ was. And that we saw that in this very chapter. Just as Jesus was obedient, the pain of obedience. Sometimes our obedience is painful. It could get us killed it could cause us to lose our job. It could cause us to be insulted. Or it's just hard because our flesh wants to do the other thing. Our flesh wants to grumble. The pain of obedience will be rewarded just like Jesus. He humbled himself, became obedient to the death on the cross. God has highly exalted him. And I believe Paul was using that to say, and God will highly exalt you, not as Lord of Lords, but in this beautiful exalting and will come before God Christ and, and lay our crowns before him and rejoice in this joy. So Christians that know this, they know, yeah, it's painful, but the reward is coming and it's worth it. The third, the word of life shows us or promises us a redeemed, redeemed setbacks. What I mean by that, redeemed setbacks. Setbacks that come in our lives are always turned for God's glory and the good of the gospel. That's what Paul will say. Remember what Paul said about being in prison? Why was he not discouraged when he was in prison? Remember that? He gave a reason why he wasn't discouraged, and he told the church not to be discouraged. Yeah. The gospel was being preached. Philippians 1.12 says, I want you to know, brothers that what has happened to me, prison, has really served to advance the gospel. That's the opposite of grumbling. He's like, God takes setbacks in our lives and redeems them. 
That's, is that not a cause for gratitude, rejoicing, contentment in the face of grumbling? That we got to remind ourselves, setback, God's working for good. Setback, I mean, that, didn't see, that, that doesn't seem to make sense from my perspective. But God loves me and he's working for my good. He, he loves me and he wants to bring glory. I just trust him. That's, that's found in the word of life. That's the, that's the implication of the gospel. And the last thing is, the word of life promises present communion with Christ. It promises a present communion with Christ. So Paul has been a very, he, though he's a very joyful Christian, he's also a very, He's, he's a suffering Christian. He suffered a lot. And yet he'll, he'll write, and we'll get there in probably a month or two. Philippians 3, 8. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things. But I don't grumble. My tone is, I... I suffer gladly the loss of all these things that I may gain Christ. I have Christ. I know Christ. He's mine. I have communion with him now in this present reality. The gospel, the word of life, is more than the fact of I just get to go to heaven when I die. And I don't have to go to hell. It's more than that. It is. I have a secure outcome. And so I don't grumble. I'm on a mission. And it's... I have, obedience may be painful, but it's worth it. I look to the reward, just like all the saints did, as they endured their sufferings, and they look to the reward, read Hebrews 11, and they, and they know that all these setbacks, but they're not going to grumble because just around the corner, behind a frowning providence is God's smiling face working. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower because God is working all these things for our good. And he'll, he'll turn these things around, even though I may never see how they turn around. And lastly, because in all of this, I get to know Christ. For Paul, it wasn't, I just want safety in a heaven bliss without Christ. For me, what's heaven is Christ. To be a Christian, to the gospel is to know God and Jesus, to truly grow, to know him personally. Jesus isn't a means to your joyful end. Jesus is the end. He is our glory. He is our joy. And Paul says the answer to any true contentment in the gospel, and that's why we hold to the word of life. And of course, if we hold to it that way, we can't help but go, I want others to be brought into it. And so I have to hold it forth. And I, and, and I get to hold it forth, in a sense, showing off how good it is by validating it with, with a life that's imperfect, but growing to be blameless in that we trust and aren't disputing or grumbling. And oh, do we need God's help for that, don't we? So, God, I pray that you would please, in America, help us for our brothers like David Livingston in India where they face a lot more overt persecution, help them. For my friends, the Paganos in China who experience the underground church or the small churches there that are facing increased persecution, help them to not grumble. But China is a light. God, prepare us now to be grumbleless Christians that are joyfully looking and holding fast to the word of truth. Help us to do that and help us now as we pray and seek you. In Jesus' name, amen. Dan, if you could come lead us. We usually, we get, we'll get done, we can go till seven after eight. How's that? Then the teens have a, if we were...